This is chapter number six. Genesis chapter number six. I appreciate that special. Um, it's really one of my favorite songs, and it actually goes along with the message this evening. I got a blessing out of that. I like your pastor. <clears throat> I tell you, uh, any pastor that's got a beard, I like that. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Um, I had a beard, and then I, I was in North. I, I was in a First Baptist Church famine from 2000 to 2008. Went back to North Carolina. Uh, I let the beard grow really long. And then I came back to uh, Indiana in 2017, and I was on my bus route for, I can't remember, five, six months or so. And then um, what the, the bus captain's wife said, you know, you need to shave that beard. It, it'll probably help you get a wife. So I shaved it. And then I started dating my wife shortly thereafter that. And then uh, she told me that she liked beards. <laughs> Now, when she said that, I drew it like I had before, and she said, no, not that long. Um, so, anyway, well, uh, so l let me tell you this. Uh, I'm not going to go line by line through all of Genesis chapter number six. Uh, there is a truth that I want to share with you. This is the truth that uh, made a giant difference in my life. Uh, Brother um, Kevin Wynn came to First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, preached a missions conference, and this is not his message by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, the same central theme uh, that made a profound impact in my life, probably more than uh, any one message that I can remember other than the one that called me into full-time Christian service. Uh, and I want to share that message, that, uh, that, that, that truth with you. But in order to get the full impact of this truth, there's a, a lot of foundational work I need to make. So probably the message itself uh, is going to be fairly short. What we would call the message is uh, probably only 15% of what I'm actually going to speak about. Uh, I am aware of what time it is. I did go a little bit longer than what I usually do with the presentation. I have a clock right here uh, reminding me in uh, big print that I can see what time it is. I won't be very long. But uh, Genesis chapter number 6, I'll start reading in verse number 1 after I have a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you, and it's a great honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much. It's uh, preaching your word is something that no human being is uh, worthy to do, uh, myself included. But I pray that uh, you would use me to uh, save them which believe. I uh, pray that you would uh, use me to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, starting here at verse number 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, I find this very interesting because in Genesis chapter number 6, if you were to read the whole chapter, and uh, we're not, but uh, if you were to read the whole chapter, you would see that uh, the, this is the story of why God destroyed, uh, destroyed the entire human race except for one man and his family. And uh, it looks like God could have saved a little bit of time and just told us what he did. He said, I, just, I destroyed the entire human race except for one man and his family, but he doesn't do that here. Uh, the central theme of the entire Bible is that God wants to have a relationship with you, you personally, okay? So uh, as a part of that, he doesn't just always go through the Bible and say, I did this, I did this, I did this. He gives us the context of why he did what he did, because uh, God wants to have a relationship with you, and a part of having a relationship with somebody is understanding one another. And it's not possible for God to understand us any more than he already does. He knows everything. He wants us to understand him. So he gives us context, and it's a good thing that he does, because God later on, and I'm not going to go into this verse, but he uses, uh, when he's uh, going to destroy all mankind, he uses a word, destroy, that if you study it out, it literally means to completely wipe out. It's as if a, a painter was making a, a work of art, and he found something he didn't like there, so he wiped one area off, completely erased it, and then painted over it. So now the only two people that know what uh, used to be there is the painter himself and whoever the painter decides to tell. God completely eradicated the culture uh, that was existed in the flood. So now the only thing we know about what life was like there is what we find in the Bible. And here, out of all the different things that he could mention, and he mentions a lot in Genesis 6, but he chooses to start off with something very interesting. He says, the sons of God... So the people that identified with him saw the daughters of man, the people that identified with mankind in the world, saw that they were fair, and they took them wives of all whom they chose. 
Uh, basically, in a modern-day vernacular, they would, uh, dads would presumably look at their children and say, uh, son, what are you doing? Said, well, dad, I'm going to marry her. Well, does she believe in Jehovah God? Well, that doesn't matter to me. She's the prettiest girl in this whole town, and that's who I'm going to marry, that she's fair, that she's attractive. And I thought about that, and I thought of, you know, there are things in here about violence and bloodshed and wars and, and imaginations of man's heart being evil nonstop, and, and why would you start with that? Well, I thought of it from the standpoint of a dad. Because I understand that my children are young, but I can't imagine anything more that would hurt me as a dad for me to devote 20 plus years of my life showing my son, you know, things like, uh, son, this is what the Bible says, how you go to heaven. Uh, this is how you lead a soul to Christ. Uh, this is how you work a job. This is how you uh, uh, shake someone's hand and, and showing my little girl, sweetheart, this is uh, how a man is supposed to treat you. This is what you're supposed to look for in a husband. And uh, only to have them throw all that away when they get to be about 20, 22, 23 years of age by marrying a lost person. Uh, I've been in church uh, since 1999, and I can tell you I've seen it happen. Uh, it's a very sad thing that, uh, you know, a child would come into church, and they'll start off in the nursery. Then they'll go to the junior church, and then they'll work their way up to uh, the teen church. And then they'll come in here, and I'm used to calling this big church. This is where the big people are. And uh, by height, not necessarily anything else. But they, they'll come in here, and then they'll, get to go, they'll go to college. They'll marry a lost person, and you never see them again. Because I understand that sometimes what happens is a sage person marries a lost person, and sometimes that lost person does get saved and they have children and uh, they come to church and they, they give their life to God and, and they, everything turns out okay. But most of the time that is not what happens. Right. Most of the time what happens is the one that's lost in the relationship has more of an influence and uh, the one that's saved stopped goes, going to church. And the children already, due to our sinful human nature, have a natural tendency to gravitate toward uh, the lost and the world. And then you pull into the fact that uh, they're the ones that have the most influence in the relationship. And that's what was happening here. Uh, God's people, people that believed in God, were, pe were marrying people that didn't believe in God. And generation after generation, less and less people were believing in Jehovah God. And that grieved God and hurt him to his very core. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to go down all the way down to... Verse number, let's look at verse number 11. In Genesis uh, chapter 6, verse 11, the Bible says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So there were wars, rumors of wars, and all kinds of bloodsheds and, uh, uh, and so forth, and the imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. God uses the word imagination, uh, and uh, that's where we get the word image from. So he wants to remind us that I can see, I, it's not just the audible thoughts that we have, like if I pray silently in my heart or in my mind, God hears that. God wants us to know that he can see the actual images that we're forming in our hearts and our brain, and uh, it's only evil nonstop, and all this stuff uh, hurts me. And by the way, uh, it wasn't that God just got angry and he decided to wipe everybody out. Uh, God gave mankind to get, uh, time to get their act together. He gave them 120 years. And another thing, it says that he was grieved, he was hurt. Uh, it wasn't that he was angry, it was that he was hurt. And he says, I'm hurt to the point where I'm going to destroy all mankind except for this one man and his family. And I find it very interesting that he says, I'm going to use the very earth to do it. If you remember in Genesis chapter number 1, the Bible says that uh, he separated the waters that were above the earth from below the earth. And then the Bible also indicates that uh, he set boundaries for the waters that they will not pass his commandment. And then the Bible also says that he sustains all things by the power of his creation. The, the reason that the earth rotates the way it does and the universe is the way it is because he keeps everything going. And here he says, I'm going to use the very earth that I created uh, you to protect, you to keep, you're filling with bloodshed. So I'm going to use that very earth to destroy you. And uh, literally what he's saying is, I'm going to stop holding everything together. I'm going to stop having the boundaries be where they are. I'm going to let uh, the floodgates of heaven come down. I'm going to let the uh, uh, depths of the earth, the oceans come up. I'm just going to let everything chaos ensue. I'm stopping. I'm out. I'm just going to let it be what it is. Uh, and life without God is chaos. It is chaos. I know I can remember uh, as a 16-year-old before I came to Christ what my life was like. And I can tell you right now, it was chaos. And another thing is, this is a good reminder to me because I don't want there to be a time and place in my life where I, I start thinking that, uh, you know, I'm the reason that uh, everything, that every good thing that I have is because of me. It's not. Every good thing that I've ever been given is a gift from Almighty God. Uh, I don't want God to look down at me and say, okay, Jeremy. You think, that, uh, you think that the reason you're at 63% after only 13 and a half months is because you're doing something special. 
Uh, you think that uh, your wife uh, is a, an excellent driver and she's the reason that you haven't been in more car accidents that you've been in and you think that your health is because y'all are making these healthy decisions. You're not giving me any of the glory or honor or anything. Uh, let me just show you what it's like when I'm not holding all these different things at bay. And I don't want there to be a time and place in my life where God has to do that to get my attention. But uh, here I find an interesting contrast in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. Let's look at uh, Genesis 9, 11. The Bible says here, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters uh, shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Now, here in Genesis chapter number 6, God says, I'm going to destroy all mankind except for this one man in his family. And just about two and a half, three chapters later, he says, I'm never going to do this again. And it's so important to me that I never do this again, that I'm going to create rainbows and he says specifically as a reminder to me, how many of you understand that God does not need a reminder? Okay, he doesn't. Uh, he, but he says, this is very important to me that I never do this again. So let me ask you this, what changed? How did we get from Genesis 6 to Genesis 9? Uh, what changed in God's heart? The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. And what he means by that, uh, among other things, is that uh, it, you're not going to be able to change his mind about stuff. So in other words, uh, it's not like uh, uh, sin has been around for so long and, and maybe God felt one way 6,000 years ago, but now these, there's certain sins he doesn't care about anymore. Uh, uh, you can lie and it doesn't bother him. You can steal and it doesn't bother him. No, no, no. He still feels the same way about sin now as he did then, and uh, he's always going to feel the same way about sin. But here, something changed in how God viewed mankind. Something pleased him, and it pleased him to the point where he looked at mankind a little differently, and he says, I'm never going to destroy the earth again, not with water. Now, if there was something that uh, pleased God to that point, I would like to know what it is, because if you study Genesis 6, it'll remind you of the world today. The same things happen today. God's people marry lost people. Uh, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. There's uh, a men of renown and people trying to make a name for themselves and, and all kinds of violence and bloodshed and wars. You know, in America, we can turn on the news or uh, look at the, the top stories on the Internet and it'll tell you some of the wars. It'll tell you about uh, the war that's going on in uh, Israel. It'll tell you about the war that's going on in, in Russia and uh, Ukraine. But there's all uh, bits of uh, violence and bloodshed throughout the entire world that you don't really hear that much about. And uh, we're living in the days of Noah. So if something pleased God back then, uh, based upon how the world was back then, the same thing would please God now. And if I, if I knew what it was, I'd love to see if there was possible for me to do the same thing that would please the Lord. And the wonderful thing is that the Bible tells us exactly what it was. Let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. The Bible says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Now, uh, God said, I knew that man, I know mankind did not do his act together. I know that mankind did not learn his lesson, that uh, they're only evil from their youth. They're going to go back to the way they were. You know what would happen if today God destroyed every single human being off the face of the planet except for one man and his family? Uh, we'd go back the exact same way that we were because we have a sinful human flesh. But God said, Noah, because of what you did, even though you, mankind didn't get his act together, because of what you did, it pleased me to the point where I'm never going to do this again. Now, uh, that was all that foundational. I got three very quick New Testament applications that we can make to our lives today, and they all three of these made a giant impact in my life. Uh, first, let's look at uh, Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number four. The first thing is what Noah did here, it pleased God. It pleased God. And if you look at Philippians chapter four, verse 15, the Bible says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire a fruit that may abound to your account. Watch this in verse 18. But I have all in abound, I am full. 
having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. God uses the exact same terminology here, and I don't for a moment think it's a coincidence. In Philippians 4, what was happening is there was one specific church that took up an offering so that a missionary could go to another country and give out the gospel. And God looked down at that church and said, that reminds me of what Noah did. That, what that church just did pleases me. Okay, and uh, I can see that you're a missions-minded church. You're having a, a missions conference. That's, that's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of expense. There's a lot of prayer that needs to go into that. There's a lot of preparation. Uh, and uh, I, some churches, they just don't want to have all the work. But I'm telling you, I, I'm very grateful for the fact that y'all are a missions-minded church and you're having a missions conference. But um, uh, I, if anything else, I want to encourage you to keep it up and have it a heart for missions. Amen. Because when you, just like that in Philippians chapter 4, the same thing applies to you. The same thing applies as it did in uh, Noah's day. When you obey the Lord by returning 10% of everything that God's blessed you with, the first 10% of everything God's blessed you with, you return, you pay as a tithe. But on top of that, when you put a little bit more or a lot more in the offering plate so that uh, for the cause of Christ through missions, so missionaries can go around the world and present the gospel, God looks down at this church and goes, what that church just did pleases me. And not just the whole church, you specifically, when you do that, God looks down at you in your life and says, what they just did pleases me. And in a world that stinks with sin, left and right, in a world that stinks with sin, if this is something that I could do, though, please God, uh, I, I can't think of any reason that I wouldn't want to do it just out of sheer, sheer gratitude for him, even if there was no reward for it. But the wonderful thing is, is that not only do we get to please God by doing this, but we get rewarded for it as well. You know, the psychologists have identified uh, multiple central questions. And what that means is it doesn't matter where you're born in the world. Every single human being has the thought process of why am I here? Well, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, we were created by God for his pleasure. The whole reason that we exist is to please God. And this is something specifically that God says pleases him. Uh, secondly, let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. The second thing is, is that uh, as far as we know, this was not commanded. Uh, uh, God was very specific about everything. He said to Noah, I want you to build an ark. I want it uh, to be made to these exact dimensions. I want it to be made out of this specific type of wood. I want it three stories high. I want there to be a door right here. I want there to be a window right here. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that, uh, uh, Noah, when you get off the ark, I want you to sacrifice unto me. So as far as we know, God did not command Noah to do this. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, verse number 11, the Bible says, uh, I'm sorry, verse number 7, the Bible says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Now listen, if you wanted to show God that you love them, you could say, well, you know what, uh, I read my Bible. I, I pray, I go to church, I, uh, I go soul winning. But you know what? All of those things are commandments. And uh, the Bible says, so likewise, when you shall have done all those things which were commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. But what I'm really glad about is that God specifically, specifically says that there's something that we could do to show him how much we love him. The Bible says to prove the sincerity of your love. And uh, we, you're probably familiar with Romans 5, 8. The Bible says, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That word commendeth is a word that means showed or proved. So literally what God is saying is I showed you and I proved to you how much I loved you by what I did. And I'm allowing you the same opportunity to show me how much you love me by what you give. And if you stop and think about what God gave, God gave what was most precious to him. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave what was most precious to him. So that tells us right, right off the bat that God loves us very, very much. And today he's asking, like, how much do you love me? Uh, lastly, let's look at, uh, I want you to stay in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to read uh, Genesis uh, 9-1. The last thing is, this benefited Noah when he did it. Uh, Genesis 9 1 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10, the Bible says, And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you. 
who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. You know what that word expedient is a word that means advantageous or profitable. God said this is profitable for you. Now, when you give to the Lord, because that's what you're doing, you give to the Lord by giving to missions. And when you give to the Lord by giving to missions, uh, yes, that country over there that, uh, that uh, gets another missionary, that country benefits. Uh, I believe you are supporting some in uh, Ukraine and so forth. And yes, Ukraine benefits because they get another gospel preaching missionary. But you know what? The Bible says you benefit. This is advantageous for you. Now, I don't have time to get into uh, the different things that happened in my life when I started giving aggressively to missions. But uh, there's been a relationship with the Lord that I, I've never experienced prior. Wisdom and, uh, and so forth that I wouldn't change for anything else in the world. I can look at you in the eye right now and without a doubt say that my wife has a better husband because I gave address of leading missions. I'm not everything I should be. I fail on a consistent basis, but I shudder to think about what I would be like if I did not give the missions at all. And uh, uh, my, my children have a better uh, daddy because I gave address of leading missions. And if you think about it, <clears throat> uh, people will say all kinds of things. I've had people tell me, I'm not really worried about war- rewards in heaven. All I'm worried about is getting there. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than, than, yeah, I understand the concept because going to heaven certainly beats the alternative, all right? But what did Jesus Christ say? Jesus Christ is God. He lives in heaven, and he said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What is he saying? He's saying, this is my home. I know what it's like up here. Trust me, when you get up here, you're going to want to have rewards. Uh, Would you bow your heads and you close your eyes, please? I have a a few closing thoughts that I'd like to, to share with you. You know, there's a... A missionary by the name of Jim Elliott, and um, he uh, is famous for a statement that he made. And really, uh, missionary Jim Elliott, his statements were used to the Lord to finally confirm to me that it was God's timing for us to go to the mission field. And he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now think about that. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And uh, if you think about that, that's a biblical concept. You know, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, uh, if you, if you uh, earned a reward, you know, up in heaven, that's not going to rust away. That's not going to go bad. Nobody's going to steal it. Anything that you've earned, you get to keep. You know, the Bible says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, Jesus Christ could come back at any time. And when he does, all of us, we're all going to say either I'm glad I did or I wish I had. You know, when I'm uh, out soul winning and uh, I meet somebody... And uh, I, I go throughout the whole plan of the salvation and the gospel. And, and they tell me, well, I believe what you're saying. I just, I'm not ready to accept Christ. I want to wait until I'm 30. I want to wait until I get out of college. I want to wait until I get out of the military. I'm going to wait until I get married. Or, or whatever the case may be, I'll look them in the eye and I'll tell them, you need to accept Jesus Christ because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And uh, if you die without Jesus Christ, there's nothing to indicate that you have any more opportunities. You're going to go to hell and you're going to be, one day you're going to be bound hand and foot and cast into a lake of fire forever. Well, you know what? There's a similar concept for us. You know, we don't have to worry about going to hell, but uh, you know what? There's nothing in the Bible that indicates that we get more opportunities for rewards after we die. I don't for a moment believe that there's going to be offering plates passed around in heaven. I don't for a moment believe that there's going to be soul winning in heaven. The only time that we have to earn eternal rewards, rewards that we will uh, be able to enjoy throughout all eternity is the time that we have now. And in a world that stinks with sin, if this is something that I could do that would please the Lord and I would get rewarded for it forever, I can't think of any possible reason in the world that I wouldn't want to get in on it. Pastor. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. It's a sobering, serious, and also happy thought that we have an opportunity to do something that pleases the Lord. And any time that a Christian finds something in the scriptures that identifies something that you can do to please the Lord, why wouldn't you want to do it? Well, because it's going to cost me something. Yeah, but you get to please the Lord. But it's going to be, it's going to be a sacrifice, but you get the opportunity to please the Lord. And isn't pleasing the Lord uh, the most important thing in the Christian life? But it comes right down to it. With our heads bound and our eyes closed as we stand to our feet and the piano begins to play, if God is speaking to your heart.